I tell you, what a blessing, right? The beginning, I'm gonna, I've been instructed to turn these off so we hang on to the battery for at the close. Well, I tell you, what a blessing, right? That was awesome. We appreciate it very much. Uh, having uh, Eddie and Julie and, and all singing. We're going we're gonna to be singing that song, Overcome, again. Um, or Overcame, I think is the name of it. And we're going to do that at the end of the service. But uh, what a privilege it is to be able to, to go into this study. We have, we're actually on the very last church of the seven churches in Revelation. And uh, we've been talking about, and then go ahead and put that first thing on the screen there if you would. One of the things that we've been talking about is what God wants us to become. And one of the things that I have put up as a little quote is, Life is not a having and a getting, but a being and a becoming. It's not about what we have or what we get, but it's about who we are becoming. And God wants us to become honorable to Him. He wants our life to be centered around bringing honor and glory to Him. And so sometimes we get caught up so quickly in all that we have and all the things that we possess. And yet on the same hand, we fail to realize that God is more interested in not what we have, but in who we are. That's why we're called human beings and not human havings, right? We're human beings. It's about who we're being. And I trust that we can understand that as we've been going through this study. Uh, we have gone from a personal level of how God wants us to reflect on our life and who we are and who we are becoming. But then we've moved right into uh, who the church is becoming. And I tell you, just like the video had shown a while ago, how that these things, we are to keep them. Right? The Bible says we're to keep these things. And how important is we understand these things are written so that we can have a full and complete understanding of this age that we live in. I believe the seven churches, and as a church we believe in uh, dispensationalism, and we believe that there are the different dispensations. We believe in the seven churches are the representation of the different church ages. Now, I will say that in those church ages, uh, we have been dealing, actually we dealt with, and we're going to go ahead and show you this, the seven churches of Revelation. The last four uh, here are the ones that are, are found in our, um, in our time frame today and what we live. There's the church of Thyatira, which is a Catholic church. We have the church of Sardis, which is also then the, the church, the Reformation church. And those that came out of the Catholic church, they were reformers. And they sought to reform uh, the Catholic teaching and all. And then there's the church of Philadelphia, which is the missionary church. And all three of these churches exist during the time we live right now. And that's important to get that and to understand that. So, the next slide also shows you then that Fire Tire was a church that was, uh, had moral corruption. And it was, a, it was an idolatry that was found in that church. Then Sardis, we find it has, uh, it has the spiritual deadness that we find. Have you ever seen some churches? Man, they, they stand on being the people of God. But you go in and you feel the cold, chilly winds blow through that church because they're just dead. Unfortunately, there are those churches that exist. And then we find the church of Philadelphia. And this is a church that is warned against not holding fast. They are a missionary church. They're a church that's about reaching out around the world. It's not a denomination, by the way. It is a body that encompasses many different denominations, and, 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 but it's not particular to any denomination. But I praise the Lord that, by and large, or at least Milro Baptist Church is a Baptist church. We are a missionary church. We're a church that believes in missions. We are about getting the good news of Jesus Christ out and around the world. That's our heartbeat. It's what we're about. We want to love God, we want to love others, and we want to make a difference. And we do that by partnering together with others who go around the world to preach the gospel. We're a missionary church. We believe in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we find ourselves as a church here in, the, in this church age as being of the church of Philadelphia. 
And this was a church that God was pleased with, but yet there was a warning to them to hold fast. I think the scripture tells us to not grow weary in well-doing because we'll reap if we what? If we faint not. If we don't faint, we'll reap. But boy, it gets hard sometimes, doesn't it? You feel like you're holding this stuff. You feel like things are, are flying all around you. You feel like you're in a whirlwind. You're hanging on for dear life. And yet you find yourself in that place where it seems as though when all hope is gone, yet as we hold fast to that which is true, the Bible says God will honor us for that. Here within these churches, by the way, am I on, on my mic? I mean, I'm probably on, I can't, all right, I think I'm on, all right. I can't remember turning it on. See, that's the point after 45, you don't remember stuff. I'm thinking, did I turn on my mic? I don't even know if I turned on my mic. All right, well, okay, good. Uh, this is true. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> One of the things I want you to see here within these churches, is this what I, I don't want you to miss? Is, and we can show you this next part, is the church of Laodicea, the church, the Laodicean church, is a church that is encompassing those that are found in the church of Thyatira, those that are found in the church of Sardis, and those that are found in the church of Philadelphia. In other words, it is... A, it is a mind that's set across all of these different churches. And the church of Laodicea can be found in any of these works. Now, of course, we know the church of Sardis is a church that they have, um, they have pageantry without substance. They have show without substance. They're, they have all that they hold fast to doctrinal truth, but they have no love. They have no concern. They have no care for others. You ever been in a place like that? It's like, I mean, you know, they want to preach the Word of God and they want to tell you the way it is. And yet, when it comes to the level of having compassion and love and care for other people, it's gone. It's not there. And that's dangerous. That's a dangerous place to be. But this church of Laodicea, it is a church that is lukewarm. It's a church that has religion and no zeal. It is known as what we would call the composite church. It is the different churches that are combined and thus we find the world council of churches. You've heard of that, right? And in the world council of churches we find this glomeration of different churches uh, of different sectors of people and churches that are represented. But yet it is that which has, uh, it has a show, but it has no substance. And that's a dangerous thing. I want you to know that this church of Laodicea is concerned about social redemption. They're all about redeeming society. Trying to see that our society is redeemed. But I want you to understand this. That God is concerned about personal redemption. He wants us to know Him on a personal level. He wants the person to be redeemed. I want you to know this. You can't regulate righteousness. There's those that try to set up laws and rules to dictate what people do in order that they are found to be righteous. My friend, you cannot regulate, you cannot legislate righteousness. You can't do it. Righteousness is found in the heart. And it begins with each individual. And as righteousness is found in the heart, as redemption is found on a personal level, then our society begins to change. Towards righteousness. See how that works? When we get so consumed and caught up with trying to change everything about our political system. My friend, I want you to know this. That when it comes to the church of Laodicea, it is a church that's lukewarm. It leaves the responsibility of the church to the government and to other people. And we have a responsibility as a church to make a difference in the world. And when we set back and leave that responsibility to someone else, we're failing to do our job. God has called us to holiness and righteousness. 
I want you to see today that Laodicea, the, the Laodicean church, had a closed door of self-reliance. It had a closed door of self-reliance. They were a people that were self-reliant. They didn't need anybody. They didn't need anything. As we look here in this book, or in this chapter here, you're going to find that this is a people that were self-sufficient. You ever meet someone like that? Self-sufficient people? They don't need nobody else? Matter of fact, you feel like you're in their way most of the time? They're self-consumed, self-sufficient. This is a people who are self-sufficient. And so therefore they had, they had a closed door. Now this closed door has nothing to do with what we talked about uh, with the Philadelphian church. Because remember we talked about how that uh, God has opened a door to the Philadelphian church. That's a door of evangelism. And the door that God has opened no man can shut. And the door that God shuts no man can open. That's the door of evangelism. That's the door of opportunity. As I was sharing with you last week, that we have right now in this day and age to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And nobody can stop us from doing that. Oh, they might stop a person, but they'll not stop the movement. Because the movement is of God. God has opened the door for that movement to happen. Isn't that awesome? So when you get apprehensive and nervous about sharing the gospel of Christ with somebody, yes, you should be as well polished as possible. You ought to be as well prepared as you can. But listen to me. It's not up to you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit doing His work through you to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we have to be faithful to share the good news. Because God has opened a door that no man can shut. Now people try to shut you up. And they might silence you. But they'll never silence the movement as long as God has the door open. No man can shut it. So what, what should be our heart? Our heart is the Philadelphian church ought to be the heart and passion of going and sharing the good news and not letting anything hold us back. Telling others of the wonderful saving grace of Jesus Christ. So I just want to Give this thought to you and then this thought that I'm giving to you right now is going to kind of go through this message today and we're going to close with this thought as well. Is this, be open to receive Jesus supreme. Be open to receive Jesus supreme. We need to be open to receive Jesus supreme. Now I want you to know this, listen. The problem with the... With the church of Laodicea, it was they were a self-sufficient church. They didn't need anything from God. They didn't need anybody, uh, anything from anybody else. They were a self-sufficient people. When they had great ruin take place in their city, they didn't ask for help. They didn't receive help from anybody else. They were a proud people that took care of their own. But what we need to be is a people that are open to receive Jesus Christ, supreme. So with that in mind, take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to look at these verses here together. And of course, we're going to look at verse number uh, 14. That's where we're going to begin. At verse 14 of Revelation chapter 3. And the scripture reads, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Okay, we got to stop here and look at this for just a minute. These things says the amen. What does the word amen mean? Alright, that's right. So be it. That's it. So be it. Here speaks the one that says so be it. That's Jesus Christ. The amen. When do you generally find an Amen. You generally find it at the end of something said, right? He is the final authority. He's the last call on it. He is the amen. And it goes on to say, not only is he the amen, but the faithful and the true witness. What does the Bible tell us about his faithfulness? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He is faithful. We can count on him always. He's faithful and true. He's a true witness. Of the Father's love. 
Now get this, the beginning of the creation of God. Isn't it awesome to know that Jesus Christ was with the Father in creation and He is the one who was there performing the duties of His Father in creation. Isn't that awesome? 1 John 1, or not 1 John, but John chapter 1 in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God in the beginning. What a great story to be told. Almost every story when we were growing up always began once upon a time, right? Once upon a time. Once upon a time. There was a fair maiden, right? You know, once upon a time. We... But listen, this is the greatest story ever told. Is in the beginning, once upon a time, way in the beginning. And Jesus is the one that was in the beginning, the beginning of the creation of God. See, in the church of Laodicea, there was a debate and argument that Jesus uh, had his beginning at his birth on earth. But listen, Jesus always has been. Now, he wasn't known as Jesus, but he has always been the Son of God. He's always been. Always in existence. It wasn't until his birth that he took on the name Jesus. And therefore, the name Jesus was birthed at his birth. But he has always existed. We find, if you look through Scripture, you'll find several occasions where Jesus, you'll see that his presence is there. Jesus is found talking to Moses in the burning bush. And he says, who should I say has sent me? Jesus, who wasn't named Jesus at the time, but the Son of God, said, tell them that who sent you? I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the great I am. He has been since the beginning. In the beginning of, and when I say in the beginning, I mean in the beginning of creation, in the beginning of our existence, He was, and He was before we were. He always has. Now, it's important that we not miss that. I don't want you to miss that. Because as we move through the me message today, that's going to become more powerful to you to understand who Jesus is. The one who is the messenger. The one who is giving this message to this church. He says in verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. Now look at verse number 16. It says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. What is he saying here? He's saying, because you are lukewarm. We all know what lukewarm's like, right? There's nothing worse than putting something in your mouth that don't taste good. Back years ago when I was, I guess, 19 years old, I was into weightlifting a lot. I mean a lot. And I'd, I'd lift and I'd run and I got into it so much I'd eat a lot of protein, a lot of tuna for protein and, and then I, and I got this and I decided to get this protein drink. And this protein drink, I love strawberries. So I had to get strawberry protein drink, right? So I went to the mall, went to the healthy food place. And I got this protein drink. And it talks about how that you get to make a milkshake out of it. This is getting really good. I'm getting excited. I can't wait for this milkshake. So I get home and I read on it, learn how to do it. Next morning I get up and boy, I get the, the blender out and you take the ice and you grind up the ice and you blend it up real nice and you, and you take this powder and you put it into uh, some water and you put that ice down in there and stuff and you mix that up and, and I mean, if you do the ice right, it looks like more, I mean, it looks like ice cream. It looks like a slushy. I'm thinking, oh man, this is going to be good. I take that thing, I pull it back and it, boom, against my lip. And I start to put it in my mouth. And I kid you not, my stomach said, you will not bring that down here. <laughs> I thought I was going to hurl. I got that stuff down in my mouth and I, it was not going. I tried to swallow and it wasn't going to happen. 
How many of you had any of that protein drink before? All right. Yes, you know what I'm talking about, right? How many of you kept drinking that protein drink? One of you. You guys are strange. All right. Anyway, you learned how to doctor it up, I guess. I don't know. That's chocolate. Maybe that's what it was. You know, it was like, it was like eating chalk in ice. It was nasty, it had no taste to it, and it tastes like putting a, a ball of chalk in your mouth with a bunch of ice. That's what it tastes like. Oh, it was nasty. I think all of us know what it is. And, and then, you know, I mean, I was really into that. I was like, you know, taking raw eggs and drinking raw. I was doing the whole, I mean, I was serious about it. I wasn't horsing around. And that didn't turn out so good either. Uh, every time, you know, you got to do this mind game with yourself and say, this is really good, you know. It, I, but actually, it was better than the protein drink, I'm just saying. Have you ever had something you put in your mouth and you said, it ain't going to happen? Anybody? Huh? A few of you? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Got a witness? All right. You know what that's like? You put that in your mouth, no way, it ain't going to happen. And here's the deal, we find that Jesus is saying to this church, that because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot. Now, I just want you to think about this for a minute, if you would. Is that Laodicea, they had a really poor water supply and stuff. As a matter of fact, they were lacking water, so they had to build uh, something. It was underground to get a water supply. And they had two different uh, cities around them. One had a really cold uh, water. It was, it was a mountain cold water. They had another city not too far from them that had a hot springs type water. So they understood what hot water and cold water. I, I tell you something, I like cold water. And then I like hot water if I got some coffee in it. It's just good, right? Hot or cold, that's all right. It's palatable, can receive that. But have you ever poured yourself a cup of hot coffee and forgot about it? And about 30 minutes later, you come back to it. But you felt like it was only like five minutes ago, and you take a big old swig of that, and it's like, it's, yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not cold, but it's not hot at all, and it's just nasty. You know what? This is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look, you're neither cold nor are you hot, and because of it, I, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You know what that word spew there means? It means to vomit. It means to puke means to hurl. I know some of you are backing it up right now. You're, okay, quit talking about it, Pastor. All right, you feel it kind of, you know, all right, look. Here's the deal. We find here where Jesus himself is saying that because of your lukewarmness, you're neither cold or hot. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand this because I want you to know this church was a church of unredeemed people. They were unsaved people. We're not talking about people that were Christians. These are not Christians. They're unsaved people. Jesus is outside the door. Knocking. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. So we find these unsaved people who are trying to do the religious thing. You think we find any of those in churches today? People that are unsaved playing the game. I've talked to some of you just this week talking about how that there are those who just kind of play the game. They, go, they learn how to go through the motions and yet it, they're not genuine. They're not real. But they think they are. They think because they look like this, because they look religious, that somehow or another they're going to get their way into heaven. My friend, it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why this church of Laodicea, wow, they were here, they were lukewarm. They had no zeal because they were powerless. The Bible talks about in the last days there will be those that will have the form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. There are people who water down the truth. I remember back in the day when I was a teenager, Rock groups and other such people would, 
you know, they would market themselves in a way that they would proclaim the name of Jesus, right? They'd talk about, uh, you know, they would wear their crosses or they would throw in the name Jesus or they'd throw in the name God. And, and I remember teens that were friends of mine and even myself, it'd be like, oh, well, they must be okay. They love God. Listen, just because somebody says the name of Jesus doesn't mean they love God. Just because somebody proclaims the name of God or even gives Him credit doesn't mean that they're of God. Hey, even the demons recognize Jesus in His presence. We find that throughout the New Testament, right? When Jesus showed up to the man that had the legion in him, He immediately acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God. He he acknowledged that He was, this was Jesus. Just because somebody gives acknowledgement doesn't necessarily mean that they're redeemed. I want you to understand today. Listen to me because who I'm talking about today maybe, just perhaps, could be sitting in your seat this morning. I want you to know that it's more than just going through a religious exercise. It's more than just going through a religious game. The Bible tells us that these people were not, they, they, were, they were lost and yet they were playing the religious game. And Jesus is saying here, look, if you're lost, at least I would rather you to understand your lostness. That's where the cold comes in at. Or come to that place where you understand your need for Christ and get set on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. But you're not. You're lost playing a religious game. And God says, you make me sick. I want to throw you out of my... I want to puke you up. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. That's huge. So we find that This church is the lost that claim to be saved. But yet they're lost. Verse number 17. Look at it with me if you would. And it goes on to say, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I want you to see here. He says, I, we, that church says, I am rich. I have all things. Well, they might be rich with prosperity, but they're poor in spirit. They have no power. Listen, I know that the danger of a church like this is one who has a lot of resources, but they don't have the power of God living in and through them. They claim the name of Jesus. But they don't love. You know what the Bible says about that? Oh, faith is important. But the Bible says faith without works is dead. The Bible says that if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not Love, I'm as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, right? Luke mentioned that today. If we could say to a mountain, mountain jump, and that mountain was to jump. And yet if we don't have love, God says we're nothing. We're worthless. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be found in the sight of God as being worthless. By the way, my worth is not found in my sufficiency. My worth is found in the sufficiency of Christ. None of us will ever find our sufficiency within ourselves. Some of you may think so. Some of you may think you're pretty good people. Listen, good people split hell wide open every day. It's not about being a good person. Jesus Christ died for good people. Jesus Christ died for bad people. But you know what good people have to do? They have to realize that there is no goodness within themselves before they can come to redemption. Before they can come to salvation, they have to understand they're worthless in and of themselves. Church of Laodicea, it was a mind that said, look, 
I'm good, I'm fine. Life is about my four and no more. It doesn't matter. You know, some churches are like that. They're all about being a small church, not making a difference in their world. They're happy with their little click as a church. They're happy with their little, uh, their little numbers. Listen, it's, and again, it's not about numbers, but may you understand this. God is a God of numbers. You know how I know that? Because He says to count. He says, count your blessings. He talks about counting all the time. God is a God of numbers. And we need to understand this. God has a desire for us to see and to measure up according to His Word where we're supposed to be in our heart, in our becoming more like Him. And when I become more like Him, I want to share His love with a lost and dying world. And when I do that, it's going to make a difference in the lives of people. Again, is that about... Growing great numbers of a church? No. What that's about is making a big impact. It's about making a big difference. We don't do that in our own sufficiency, in our own strength, in our own reliance. But we do that surrendered to the Lord. Verse number 18 goes on to read, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed And that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes, or and anoint uh, your eyes with eye salve that you may see. I want you to understand here that what's being said, these people, the church of Laodicea, this these people, the Laodicean uh, people, were a people that uh, they they had they had three things that they were known for. One was banking. They were, they were known for their banking. They had a banking system. And therefore, Jesus is approaching them here in verse number 18 where He says, I counsel you to buy of me what? Gold. They were also known not only for their riches, their banking, but also for their clothing. And they, were, they would make materials and clothing. And so what does He say to address that? And He says that ye may be, and it says, in white raiment, that ye may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness did not appear. And then they were also known for their medicine. They were known as a city for their medicine. And what does He do? He addresses that here when He says... And anoint your eyes with eye salve that ye may see. Now he's not talking about their physical eyes. But you know what? Remember what Jesus did when he healed those that were blind? He would oftentimes take, and like one time he took and he spit in the mud. Remember that? That's kind of nasty, isn't it? All right, and he spit in the mud and he made a mud ball and then he took that and pressed it into the eyes of that blind man. Could you imagine? What everybody standing around thought. You know, germ freaks today. I mean, if you were blind and you were a germ freak, you were in trouble. I guess the only blessed thing about it is you wouldn't know it was coming. <laughs> you, know, you know, by the time it's done, all right? And so, here's the deal. It wasn't a physical blindness that he's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual blindness. That this eye salve be put on the eyes of your spiritual blindness in order that you can see. See, they were a people that didn't realize the condition they were in. Before we go much further, I'd like to just kind of uh, parallel that with, you know, we're talking about the very last church mentioned in the seven churches. I want to go to the very last chapter of the Old Testament. And you don't necessarily have to turn there, but I want you to listen to these verses. In Malachi chapter 1, this is a Jewish people, and I want you to understand what's going on here. See, just like these people here in Laodicea were blind, listen to what was happening here. Jesus, uh, our... God was saying to this church in Malachi, or to these people in Malachi, listen to what He said to these Jews. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? You ever have anybody swing a a dude at you, an attitude? Have anybody ever swing an attitude at you? If you're married, you have. I didn't say, guys. I'm going to be the guys could do that to the women. 
If you're married, you've had an attitude swung at you at least once. If you have children, you've really had attitude swung at you. They were showing an attitude here. They said, hey look, in what way have you loved us? I want you to understand here that these people, they, they totally missed it. They didn't see what was going on. I want you to go on down and look at verse number 6. If you're there, if not, just listen. It says, uh, the, sons, the son honors his father and the servant his master. God is saying to these Jewish people, If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest that despise my name. And you say, how have we despised your name? <laughs> Cocking an attitude again. You say, you've dis- you say we've despised your name, but how have we despised your name? Do you see the blindness of these people? They didn't even realize what's going on here. And verse number 7 goes on to say, You offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, How have we polluted you? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer a lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or accept your person? says the Lord of hosts. I want you to see what's going on here. He's simply saying to them, look, you have, you have been contemptible to me. You have despised my name. You've not honored me. And they say, well, in what way have we not honored you? In what way have we despised you, Jesus? <laughs> Isn't that the most irritating voice? Wouldn't you love to be married to a person that talk like this? <laughs> And here's what he says. He says, look. Some of you say, I I have married that person. All right, here. You have polluted bread. You bring and you lay it on the altar. You offer blind sacrifices. I've told you to bring spotless animals to me. And you bring blind sacrifices to me. As though somehow your lame and sick animals are going to be acceptable to me. And God says, listen, I've given you instruction of what I want. Bring to me what I ask for. So I can't help but go back to the beginning because it's the one who was from the beginning of creation with God, right? Jesus that's talking here. So let's just kind of skip back to the beginning because there was a man by the name of Cain, another guy by the name of Abel, and uh, these two were given instruction how they were to approach God and what kind of sacrifices they were to bring to God. And, and the Bible tells us that Abel brought that which was honorable to God. He brought exactly what God asked for. Cain, on the other hand, he thought he'd bring to God what he thought was good and what he thought was right. And God just needed to get over his little cocky attitude because I'm not being despiteful. I'm not being dishonoring. I'm going to bring to God what I want to bring to God and he has to accept it. And God said, no, I don't. And the Bible says God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he rejected Cain's sacrifice. And I can assure you, Cain Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a gardener. And I'm sure that Cain probably, more than likely, had his own TV program, program on HDTV. He probably did. He was just that good of a gardener. He knew how to grow the best. And he brought... To God, the very best of what he had. But yet God rejected it. And to that, you may say, well, that's awful cocky of God not to accept what was brought to him. No. God gave clear instruction what he wanted. It was a lack of obedience on Cain's part. And because of that, we find that the first human, his blood was shed. Because Cain, in his vengeance and anger and wrath, he took it out on his brother Cain and he killed his brother. So I want you to understand this, that you may say, you know, 
Preacher, I know the Bible says that we're supposed to serve God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. I, I realize that. But you know, I just don't have a whole lot of time in the day. I just don't have a whole lot of finances. I just don't have a whole lot of energy. I just don't... And you can make all the excuses you want to make. But my friend, unless you're giving what God asked for, He's not going to receive what you're bringing. Do you understand that's why it's so crucially important that we understand what God's Word says that we need to bring before the Lord? What does God accept? He accepts a pure sacrifice, an honest sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. By the way, where do we get, where do we get, what is the definition of the word holy? Can somebody tell me the word holy? Alright? The word holy just simply means set apart for God, by God. Holy is to be set apart for God, by God. So when something is holy, we know it is, it is about God. It's not only about God, it is something that God says is to be set aside for Him and Him alone. Do you realize that your praise, your worship... Your attention, all these things are things that we ought to set aside for God. Bringing of our tithes and offerings to storehouse. Again, we could go on through in the book of Malachi. And if you go to chapter 3, uh, you'll find in Malachi chapter 3, again, God says to the people there, He says, look, you have robbed me. And they say, oh yeah, where in have we robbed you, God? <laughs> they, they got an attitude through this whole book, I'm just saying. And how they equal to this church of Laodicea. I mean, there's parallels here. We see at the end of the Old Testament what's going on. We see at the end of church age what's going on. An attitude. How have we robbed you? God says in your tithes and offerings, you've robbed me. By the way, the tithe is of the what? Is of the Lord, right? The tithe is the Lord's, right? The tithe is not the laws. The tithe is the Lord's. Some people try to say, oh, tithing is Old Testament law, blah, blah, blah. No, the Bible says tithing is the Lord's. If it's a Lord's, it's a Lord's, period. And the word tithe, what does the word tithe mean? Ten, a tenth means 10%. So that's where we get the 10% at. Why? All right, and again, I just want to just, this needs to be a constant reminder to you because you know what? This is not, by the way, we're not here to ask you for your money. We're not here, I want you to get that and understand that because it's not about anything. And really, Dale, we're not. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It's not about us asking you for your money. Here's the deal. When God asks something of you, if you're not bringing the sacrifice He is asking for, then why would we ever be surprised that God's not receiving our sacrifices? We have to bring them what He asks for. So, let me just put it this way really quick. And I'm just going to hit this real fast. Because, you know, when you get on talking about money and tithing and stuff like that, I think people have a misconception of this thought. Here, here it is real quick. God told the people to bring the first of those animals that were born. And those first of the animal, that's called the firstling. God said, bring the firstling to me. That's the first top 10% of what they had. To bring that to Him. Let me ask you this. Why is it an act? First of all, we know it's an act of obedience if they bring the very first born of their, the firstling that's born from an animal and they bring it to the Lord and sacrifice it. We know that's an act of obedience, but how is that an act of faith? For those of you who have been around for a little bit, you ought to have the answer to this one. Is an act of faith because you don't know if there's going to be a second one or a third one or a fourth one. To lay that first one on the altar is an act of faith. Listen, I have people say to me, Yeah, well, I'll pay tithe when I've got enough money. I'll start. Listen, God says give him the first and he'll bless the rest. You learn to trust him with your firstling and he will bless the rest. It's an act of obedience, but also it's an act of faith. It says, God, you tell me to bring this. I don't know where the rest of it's going to come from. But if you tell me to bring it, I'm going to trust you're going to give me more. And you just trust God for it. And you do it. Been doing that since I was a little kid. Since I've, my mom and dad taught us when we were just, 
when we were out of diapers to give of, to the Lord. I didn't have a job, but they would give us a little bit of money and say, here, put this in the offering. And when we started mowing grass and stuff, when we started getting allowances, when we started getting those things, oh, you mean you pay tithe on that? Sure. Is that first what you got? Okay. Give to the Lord what is His. And when we do that, it's acceptable to the Lord. When we come to the Lord, we ought to worship the Lord with our praise and adoration, our attention, our, our heart ought to be pouring out to God and how great He is and laying true worship before God. Not coming to the Lord with a heart that's full of deceit and anger and bitterness and some of you setting back with judgmental spirits towards other people. And then you open your mouth and think God's going to receive your praise. It's despisable in the sight of God. You bring a contemptible offering to God. God says, look, have a pure heart. Know that your life is pure before the Lord. Know that you're right with other people. And then come before me and worship me. And so we find, and boy, I could be here for a while, but we're not going to do that. So we find here the children, uh, the Jewish people here, they were uh, despising God. They, they couldn't realize that they were blind, and even so this church of Laodicea, they couldn't realize their blindness. But let, now let's look at uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 19. And in verse number 19 it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. I just want you to see this. God is a loving God. And you know who He loves? Listen to me. Don't miss this. Because I know what you almost said. You almost said God loves His own. Yes, God does love His own. But God certainly loves the unconverted. Therefore, He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross of Calvary. For the unconverted. That's how much he loves them. So who are we to set back on our pedestal and look down at the unconverted and always talk about how bad they are and how rotten. Listen, what do you expect? They're unconverted. I don't expect any less out of them. God loves them and we need to reach out and care for them and love them as well to Jesus. We need to show Christ to them. And the way that we do that is by allowing the love of God to be seen in and through our life. Not by be, being a people that are judgmental towards others. Hey, you know who the Bible tells us to, that we ought to hold their feet to the fire? <laughs> It's those that are saved who live like they're not. Those are the ones that we ought to be willing to set down. When you hear somebody backbiting or murmuring or disputing or gossiping, do you know if that person claims to be a believer, you have a responsibility to go to them and talk to them about that and help them understand it's sin and it's wrong. Why? Because you're being judgmental? No, because you care enough for them that you want to see their relationship with God restored. That's hard. Because most of the people that we hear do those things are typically our friends and our relatives because we don't hang around with other people. Right? Typically, those are the ones we hear do those things. If I hear a lost person do that, I'm not going to go, Ah, oh, you shouldn't do that. They're lost. They're, they're unconverted. They don't know. Listen, we have a responsibility to care and to love for one another. We have a responsibility to care and to love for those that are lost. As Jesus says to this church, as many as I love, who does He love? He loves every unconverted member of this Laodicean church. He loves them. Thus, He stands. And he knocks. And so therefore we look here at uh, verse number 19. Uh, and I'll finish that up. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore. And what does he tell them to do? To repent. Repent. That triggers another verse in my mind. It says if, if, if they don't repent, they'll all likewise what? 
perish. Listen, I'm just saying that every person who does not come to that place of repentance, confess their sin to the Lord, call on the Lord Jesus Christ. If that be you today, you're going to perish. God's given that message, and it's clear. It's not a mistake. God wants you to encounter His love. And we want to see in verse number 20. Look at it with me if you would. Behold, what does he say? I what? I stand. That's a place of position. He's standing. He's not sitting. He's standing. I don't know about you, but oh, I remember. How many of you know Barry McGar? How many of you know Barry McGar? Okay. Barry, if you're watching on internet, talking about you. All right. Barry, he was, he's a friend. And Barry, I remember when 24, we would go over and we'd have 24 parties. And watch, anybody ever watch 24? One, thank you very much. All right, well, he'd have a 24 party and we'd go watch 24 together and we'd go over there. It was funny to watch Barry because Barry would be sitting there and that show would be so intense. Barry would be sitting there. Next thing you know, he'd get up. He'd start pacing like this. And he'd stand there and he'd just watch. And he couldn't sit down. He almost stood up the whole show. You know what? Jesus is standing. He's in attention. He's ready for our response. But he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And he's knocking. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will, what does the Bible say there? I will what? Sup with Him and He with me. That just means He'll have fellowship with us. I like supping. <laughs> We're Baptists. We love supping. <laughs> supping is fellowshipping typically around food. We might even call it supper. But it's supping. We sup together. We fellowship together. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man will open the door, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I want you to understand this is extremely important. Even in this church age, it seems almost hopeless. In this church age where there's a lot of relig religiosity, if I said that right, that'll work. Going on, there's a lot of form. But there's no life. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And listen, this is a personal call to all three of these churches. Anybody in those churches that will open that door. Jesus says, I will come in to him and I will sup with him. If he hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him. And he with me. This is what I didn't want you to miss about Jesus and who He is because He always has been. He was a creator of all things. He shows up quite a few times throughout the Old Testament. We see His presence so many times. Listen to me. And He's the one you get to fellowship with when you know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. What? That's crazy good. That's wild. Can you imagine that? The God of creation wants to fellowship with you every day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the greatest place any person could ever find themselves is at the feet of Jesus. And so we go on to see here in verse number 21 and 22, it says, To him that overcomes will I grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. By the way, the, those who overcome is not those who try. To overcome means to, to have come to the place of understanding your worthlessness and receiving the redemptive salvation of Jesus Christ Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We become an overcomer when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 
All that we may still deal with a lot of issues and problems in our life, but now we are overcomers. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, may you understand Jesus wants you to come to that place to see that you're worthless within yourself. That you don't need to just add Jesus to what you got. You need to replace what you got with Jesus. Because what you got ain't going to work. It's insufficient. I don't care how much you think of yourself and I don't care how much the world may think of you. It's only that will cause you to split hell wide open unless you come to that place of understanding your worthlessness and how awesome God is. And by receiving Him, you become an over, overcomer. And we sang about that and we're going to sing about that again to over, that we have overcome To him that overcomes will I grant to set with me in my throne. Wow. All those that are saved are going to have the privilege of sitting there at the throne of God. Some of you need to start frequenting that place today and come to the throne of grace and find your help in your time of need before the feet in the throne of God. That's what prayer is about while we're on this earth. Oftentimes when I pray, I'll close my eyes and I will picture the essence of God on His throne and I'm kneeling down before Him at His feet. And I can't help but just kind of crack my eyes open a little bit and look around as I'm there in that throne room. I happen to take note that this throne room is full of Of others at the very throne of God on their face. Some weeping and crying. As they're surrendering themselves to Jesus Christ. Others that are there that are broken hearted because they've lost a loved one in death. There are others who are in that very throne room. That are asking God why? Why do I hold this cancer in my body? Why has my family member got cancer? But in that throne room we find answers. We find the answer. Jesus Christ. The comforter. The eye salve to our blinded eyes. That we can see through His eyes the things He wants us to see. You may be here today and As a believer, you may say, yes, I'm saved, but man, I find myself oftentimes being complacent and lukewarm. My friend, you need to get on fire for Jesus Christ. And listen, that's not your preacher's responsibility. That's not your wife's responsibility. That's not your husband's responsibility. That is your place to find yourself at the throne of God, bringing to Him the sacrifices that are well acceptable before the Lord. What is well acceptable before the Lord? More than a broken and a contrite heart, the Scripture says. You need to bring before the Lord your brokenness. And understand, if not, you may be playing a religious game. You may be here and you may not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And God maybe has dealt with you. And we've had people in our church that have gone to church for years who have just recently, within the last six months, surrendered themselves to Jesus and called on Him to be their Lord and Savior because they realized they were just going through the motions. But it wasn't here. They had learned to play the game, but it wasn't real. So where are you? That's a question you have to ask yourself. Where are you? Even as I also overcame, Jesus says, and and am set down at uh, at my Father in His throne... Or with my Father in His throne. Verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want you to think about this this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Once again, I want to remind you. 